All right, everyone, I guess I will get started. So my name is Aiden Foster, and my company is Foster Interactive. We're a web development shop that works a lot with other web development shops to help uh, people implement responsive web design. Um, we also work a lot with help, helping other teams, um, coaching some of the changes that you need to do from a creative and a design workflow process for responsive design. Um, today I'm going to be speaking about the Aurora base theme and how, you, how that plays together with SAS and uh, the MEM syntax. So right off the top, I'm going to go over many, many, many details very quickly. And so I've got a link up here to this presentation right now. At the bottom of many of these slides will be an off-site link elsewhere. So, um, you know, basically we're going to be going over so much stuff that it's really, this, this presentation is intended so that probably, you know, you, you'll get introduced to a bunch of concepts now and then you can go back later and look at them in more detail. And so basically we're going to go over so much stuff, I expect you may end up feel like this. Johnny, Johnny mnemonic sort of overload. Um, so, you know, at least you've got the advantage of having the slides later. So if you overload the 80 gigabyte capacity in your brain, which is what Johnny had, uh, you can always come back later and look at the slides rather than have your brain explode. So we're going to be talking about SAS and SAS and Compass together. I kind of use this the same uh, basic components, um, but this isn't a SAS basic session, right? So what I'm going to start off with is just run through a quick set of awesome features that SAS gives us and then talk about how that's useful to combine with the Aurora based thing. So there's lots of code examples that are that that we've included or have included in these slides, and so there's this website called Sassmeister, and what Sassmeister is, it's like a code pen for SAS. So you go to this website, and I'll actually have links to the gists, which are like um, chunks of code where you can link to and see the examples that I'm talking about online. And how it works is the SCSS files, which are SAS files, get compiled to CSS. That's sort of how SAS works, and then you take those CSS and add some HTML. And on SAS Meister, you can get a live preview of the code as, uh, just in this online environment. So it's a really good tool for playing around and experimenting. So let's start with SAS, right? SAS is the core platform of the web development process that um, we've been doing recently. Uh, it runs in Ruby, and it also has a version that runs in C called LibSAS. Uh, I'm going to be sticking to the Ruby version here today because the LibSAS library is about a year older than the Ruby version. And so there are other apps out there that allows you to run SAS in like an, in an application or um, those kinds of things. But I'm today going to be talking about the Ruby flavor. So again, I'm going to just run quickly through a couple code examples here to highlight some of the features of SAS. So the first thing SAS gives us is the ability to use variables, which is incredibly useful. So throughout your structure, you use variables, you change the variables in the source files, and then it will go ahead and change the output in your CSS all over the place. The second thing it does is provide us a set of functions. So in this case, you can see the red variable, red dark, and red extra dark are simply the darken function is being applied to that base color. And so right on the SAS side of things, it's dynamically editing that variable for you. SAS also provides mixins. And mixins are like a function that outputs a reasonable chunk of code. And so with a mixin, it should have some sort of variable input. So in this case, this is a mixin that generates a link CSS output. And in the second part, you see the a link where you see the at include function, and it's calling that link function and telling it what color to generate those links with. The next sort of component that SAS gives us is the use of placeholders. So these placeholders, you can see uh, by them having this number sign on the front of a variable name. And so in the case of the first one, I've got a placeholder that defines, uh, basically it puts a, a, an after CSS declaration with a checkmark symbol in it. And the second one might be um, a default message display box, something like that. And so when you have these placeholder, placeholders in your code, you can then use the extend mixin to reuse chunks of code in different places amongst your, your SAS files, which ends up rendering out the, the same reusable chunks in your CSS, but it doesn't duplicate all the code. So it's more efficient from, uh, from the total size of your outputted CSS volume. The last thing that SAS is really useful for, and I'm going to go into this in a lot more detail later, is you can have one source SAS file, and then it can include what are called partials. So you see the underscores in the front of those SCSS file names. Those 
So that one file can go and include all these other files and then compile back out to one file at the end of the day. So this is really an important function of um, breaking up your file, breaking up the files for your themes structure into smaller little pieces so that, and then you can put them back together in one file at the end. For performance reasons, right, you don't want to be loading in tons of little CSS files because each one's it's a unique request. So you just want to have one file output. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Compass. So Compass is a library that extends SAS. Compass only runs in Ruby, so that's why I'm kind of thinking, you know, generally get up to speed on, on getting Ruby working properly. And so I'm just going to show you, Compass does a lot of stuff, but I'm going to show you a couple very simple uh, components of what Compass does that are sort of the features that I use almost on every project. So the first is vendor prefixing. You can see where, you know, CSS3 is all kinds of specifications that um, each version of the browser sort of implements a little differently. So you can, there's a whole set of mixins to cover basically every CSS3 declaration with compass mixins where you see in the top that's the SAS file and then it outputs the vendor prefixes for us, in this case for border radius, automatically. Another feature it's got that's really cool is called vertical rhythm. So vertical rhythm is a concept that's been in print design since the beginning of the printed page and what it is is from a design point of view Designs tend to look nice when text that is beside other text, the baselines of those fonts line up. And so if you see on the left, that's our, that's our main paragraph font. And on the right, there's this smaller callout. You see how every fourth line on the right, even though the font's smaller, lines up with, with, with the text on the left. So this, this kind of math makes a good design sort of layout, but actually doing the math to calculate this kind of stuff is completely mind-bending. And so this is where Compass comes in, where we just define a few variables that are like, this is the base font size, this is the line height that we want, and then we include a simple function, establish baseline, and then start using these functions adjust font size to, and it automatically calculates how much padding and font line and the line heights and all that that we need to use inside of our websites for this to happen. So you see in the case of HTML, it's, it's, it's defining everything as percentages or EM units, which are units we want to be using in our website designs because they scale beautifully and all the rest of that. But I won't be doing the math to calculate those H1s, right? Like six decimal places is, is more than I'd care to figure out, especially if you want to change it, right? So imagine you get to the end of your project and you're like, oh, the, the baseline of my base paragraph is a little too tight. You just change one variable here and it resets everything in, in your entire layouts, including all of the headings and all of the relationships between them and keeps it up so that when you have two objects next to each other, every now and then those baselines are going to line up. Another thing it does is Compass provides is spriting. So this is where Compass and SAS are a little bit different. Compass has access to your file system on your, on your drive. So what you're seeing here on the left is like a folder and a theme. I've got an image theme and icons and I just dump in tons of little PNG icons inside of there. And what it actually does is it renders that one, all those little images as one big image as, an, as, as, a, um, as a sprite file, and then it automatically calculates the math for me so it can position, if I, try and if I try and call one of these particular elements, it will automatically position the background elements and sprite it for me, so I don't need to do all this annoying math. So really, you kind of could do all this math by hand, like Compass is not providing you anything you couldn't do in CSS alone, but the 100% of science casts prefer not to be doing math. So uh, that it, it's really just a time saver. And also, you know, as I said, because it's all variable based, if you make a change later, you're not afraid of like changing something fundamental like the baseline height of your font later in the project. So this isn't a SAS basics course. So I just went through a lot of heavy duty stuff. And if you're familiar with SAS, that's probably all old news. And if you're not familiar with SAS, that's probably a, a uh, gone through way too fast to, to sort of absorb. So if you want to learn more about SAS, the saslang.com, that's the main website for SAS, their guide is really good to give you a primer on everything. And if even if you're anywhere from basic to advanced, the sasway.com has a whole bunch of articles that are really interesting, really good, good stuff for all different levels of skills. Also, just last night, I started SAS Toronto Meetup. So we're going to do, you know, every month or two, trying to work out the details. But I love this SAS stuff, and we're, we're going to do, like, basic stuff and advanced stuff as well. So if you're interested in SAS, please do join the meetup. So we're talking SAS, right, uh, which means that we're talking about Ruby, and we're talking about gems. 
And we're all Drupal people, so we probably know PHP, CSS, HTML. So if this makes you feel like you want to put a bag on your head, uh, it, it is entirely understandable. But at some point, we have to like roll up our sleeves and learn some of this stuff. So let's take a look at how this um, stack actually works. So we've got Ruby, which is our core platform. And in Ruby, we run SAS, which is a program. Which And on top of Ruby as well, we run Compass. Now, SAS and Compass, Compass requires SAS, but they're basically two different programs running in Ruby as well. And then inside of SAS, we extend what SAS does on its own out of the box by installing gems. So one might be called Breakpoint, and one is Normalize. So these are two gems I'm going to run through later. Um, Compass itself also has different kinds of extensions. And so Singularity is a grid system I really like that extends what Compass does on its own. So you end up with, say, hypothetically two projects, right? You end up on those projects, each project has its own Ruby, SAS, stack with its own unique gems. And say we work on a project a year later, we might end up with pretty much the same stack. Uh, the only difference is I switched maybe, in this example, SUSE is a grid system, uh, Singularity is a different grid system. So project to project, you, depending on what you need, you might end up with different gems. The problem really comes in is that even though there's a lot of the same gems in both projects, the minor variations in versions of gems causes a big challenge, especially if you're working on teams of different people with different versions of projects. So this is where you've got to install another layer of software to help manage the versions of both Ruby and all of the gems that you happen to have installed on a particular project. So to help manage Ruby, there's a, uh, a system called RBENV, which is a program you install. I've got the link there that sort of takes you through all the installation steps. And it's a bunch of, you know, it's a few simple command line things. But um, what that allows you to do is install multiple different versions of Ruby on the same machine. And so you can have, you know, by default, OSX comes with one. And it depends on the version that you'll end up with. But each project, depending on when you started them or, like, which developer first, first started it, it's, they're probably going to be in different versions of Ruby. So what this does is it, at the end of the day, you end up with one very simple thing. There's a file called .ruby version. And the only thing that's inside of that file is the exact number of Ruby that, that you, you need to run. And RBNV just knows that when you browse to that folder and there's a Ruby version file in there, it knows to use that version of Ruby. If you try and run it and you don't have that version of Ruby installed, it throws you an error and says, go ahead, and please go and install Ruby. So that's half the equation, right? Because Ruby is kind of the core component that loads everything else. Uh, and now we need something to manage all the variations of gems that might be installed in our projects. So this is a gem called Bundler, which then packages up all your other gems. Um, basically, how it works is you end up with a, a, a different file that's called a gem file. And it sits in the root of your folder as well. And you can see here, it's just telling you. It's like a manifest of exactly which gems of which versions this particular project is expecting. So you see the first one is Compass Aurora. And it's got the little squiggly line greater than 3. So what that means is it wants a version of 3.00 or greater. And the little squiggly line means it won't ever jump a major version. So it won't jump to 4, but it'll go as, it will get the newest version of 3 it can. In the second line, we've got Toolkit. It says 1.38. That means I want exactly version 1.38 of Toolkit. And so once you have a gem file in a project, you commit both the Ruby version and the gem file to your version control. And say a coworker downloads your whole theme, and so RBNV gets it to run the right version of Ruby, and then you just run one command line function, bundle install. It goes and downloads the exact versions of everything you need, compiles it on your computer, and gets it ready to go. And that actually generates what's called a gemfile.lock. So it's actually another file that sits inside of your project, and that's just a, a list of exactly what you expect. So say halfway through a project, you upgrade what gems you're working with, you can then, you, you just upgrade the gem file. And when you try and run something, you will see there's a difference between the gem file and the gem file.lock warn you and just say, OK, you just type in bundle update. And it goes and it redownloads everything you need. And basically, this is how you can keep your team synced up with different versions of Ruby. So now I'm going to talk about another system called Grunt.js. And, or sorry, Grunt, which Grunt is a program that's a task manager. So what it does is you, you set up scripts that do a series of tasks when you run a Grunt task. And Grunt runs on Node.js, so yes, we have to download yet another different system that we're not familiar with, but it's just like download, get the package for your OS, and install, so it's really simple. And so what you get with Grunt is you can do a series of tasks automatically. 
And these are like the boring, repetitive tasks that no one wants to be doing. So like, it can automatically compress all your images. It could optimize SVG graphics. So if you export SVG graphics from uh, Illustrator, it's got a whole bunch of crap in the header that you don't actually need for, for websites. So it'll strip that out. You could concatenate and minify your JavaScript. And Grunt can actually even run SAS. So you could run up different flavors of SAS with different settings. Uh, and so in this case, I might run SAS while I'm working on a project where it outputs really easy to read, heavily commented um, debug code inside of the CSS output. And on the flip side, when I'm ready to push stuff live, I want to minify and compress all the CSS output as quickly as I can. So I've got this article here. If you think that's crazy to run yet another layer on top for task management, Grunt for people who think things like Grunt are weird and hard. Uh, it outlines sort of the advantages and how to set it up really well. So let's recap. We've got Grunt, which runs Bundler, which runs SAS, which is extended by Compass. And to add into our front end development stack, we probably want to run Live Reload as well, which is a tool where if you save a file on your computer, it automatically updates your browser, right? super complicated to get all this stuff set up unless you run Aurora. So Aurora base theme is designed to help you set up all that crap and do all the configuration without you having to spend hours and hours and hours to set up. Now it, I will say it makes it as easy as it can be. It's, there's still a lot of different tools that you need to install in there. But if you follow the documentation and go through, it's not too bad to set up. So also just to note, there's a the drupal.org website and then there's an actual Aurora documentation website. So this is how we get it installed. First go to the installation instructions and very carefully go from top to bottom of the document following all the steps in exactly the order they outline them. I kind of like skipped on that before and like it wastes a lot of time. So just top to bottom, it's in the correct order. The next thing you're gonna do is make a sub theme. So what's interesting and unique about Aurora is it's not like any other Drupal theme I've seen. Most Drupal themes, you get either the theme and you start hacking away at it, or it's a theme that it intends for you to make a sub-theme which extends that base theme. Aurora doesn't do that. Aurora's got a gem that you run this drush command here, and it actually goes and it generates a whole fresh theme that's completely independent from Aurora and puts it in, the own, your, in a separate folder, and then you work on that theme itself. Aurora also has sort of three flavors of folder sort of structures that they work with. And there's Corona, the default one, and Polaris. And so Polaris is um, sort of biased towards uh, Smack style, if you've heard of that, that, that approach for styling your CSS. Uh, it's biased to that. Corona's the one I'm gonna be reviewing today. And Aurora default one is actually meant to kind of do style prototyping and, and switch over. But in essence, basically, they're all the same. They just have different folder structures for how they want you to organize your SAS files. Oh yes, one little note. Uh, the actual online documentation, I think in the newest version of Aurora, has an error. So be sure to add in that dash R Aurora. Uh, you'll notice at the end of the presentation, there's way less like animated slides, because that burned up a lot of my time getting past that step <laughs> as a step by step. Um, so what do we do when we're done all this process? We've got this like machine assembly line that's generating website code that's helping us do our front end production process faster. So you end up with two basic grunt commands when you're done installing Aurora. The first one is grunt build. So that runs compass and it minifies all the CSS output automatically. It makes a copy of all the images that are in my folder, copies them to another folder, compresses them losslessly, both for JPEGs and PNGs, then points your CSS file, any references to images points to these new compressed folders, and then it runs a, a JS hinter, which looks for errors in your JavaScript file. And if you have any errors in your JavaScript file, it reports them to you. In addition to that, we get grunt watch. And grunt watch is a different command. So you just, uh, that, that if we run this one, it again, it runs compass watch. So it sits there and starts watching your CSS files. Anytime it generates, sorry, watching your SAS files. Anytime it generates a new CSS output, it's in this very ver verbose with comments and debug code inside of the CSS output. And instead of pointing to those minified images, it goes ahead and points to the full high resolution images in your source. And it runs an instance of live reload on the server side, so you don't need to buy the app to run live reload. It spins one of those up in the command line for you automatically. So let's take a look at Aurora's sort of DNA. At, at its core and its, its base philosophy is that it is an HTML5 responsive theme. 
it assumes you're going to be working mobile first, and it's super, super minimal in what you get out of the box. So that's with panels and display suite. Um, it's sort of, sorry, it's, it's sort of biased towards you theming with panels and display suite, so it's very compatible with these two modules. And when I say Aurora is super minimal, this is the, 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 the region preview that you see in the admin. So there's five regions, and this is where I'm saying it's like panels biased. You would, basically they expect you to be using the main region and to start laying out all the different objects in the main region using panels. By no means do you have to, but um, I'm going to actually recommend it if you haven't looked into panels theming in a while. I kind of switched from context to panels uh, maybe six months ago, and I really have, it, have found it's very valuable, especially in this when working with this theme. So a super clean theme does not help us make super clean output in Drupal alone. Drupal 7 is a tiny bit messy uh, in its core, and Contrib has a lot of messiness on its own as well. So we need to add in some additional modules to kind of clean up this div madness mess that comes out of Drupal. So the first thing is to say, if you are using panels, do not use the draggy droppy panel builder thingy, which has to generate tons and tons of divs to do what it does. So you make a custom region template, custom panels templates. It's super easy to theme. Uh, and there's an example already built into Aurora. So you just sitting in the folder, you can just hack away at that as an example of how to get started on this kind of theming. Oh, and also if you're using panels and there's cruft in your markup, it's because you put it there. And that's sort of part of, part of the, the advantage of using it. HTML5 tools is another module that basically takes Drupal 7 really at its core is uh, HTML4. And so Drupal uh, HTML5 tools sort of converts stuff like fields and email fields and that kind of stuff into their HTML5 equivalents. And it also cleans up the head markup a little bit, which is nice. Magic module, which has the awesomest graphic there is on, on the Drupal.org page, um, is a module that affects the, um, the settings for your admin theme. And it does two major features that I'm really interested in. The first is you see that live reload up in the top left there. So it will inject the live reload JavaScript into your website. So between you know, the, the grunt command spinning up the server and this injecting the JavaScript into your server, it means you don't need to run the apps or the uh, install any browser plugins. And why this is really cool is if you're running this on any modern browser, you can be working on your website and working on your mobile device at the same time, and Live Reload will work on all your connected devices because it's not depending on any plugins. The second thing it does is this exclude CSS files uh, box you see there. So as I said, contrib core has a lot of messy stuff. By including colon core and colon contrib, 100% of the CSS generated by Drupal will be removed. And then some of the modules have you know, reasonable CSS, put the little squiggly line and point to the module CSS folder, and that lets it pass the gates. So you don't have to use magic this way, but it's kind of what I recommend. You, you could just specifically exclude bad files that are kind of annoying you, but this is a really good way to sort of clean, every, clean house and end up with a nice clean theme. Finally, there's fences module which is a module that basically takes Drupal's field outputs and cleans them up quite a bit. So if you see the example on the top, that's like a default Drupal field output. And then if you just tell it to have you know, some field have a wrapper of div, that at the bottom, that's what it's outputting there. So it very much cleans up the fields uh, in, in your site. And actually, a whole bunch of other modules plug into fences. Uh, so it starts understanding. Those other modules can now understand native HTML5 elements, like a side and header and footer. Um, uh, via fences. Finally, we've got conditional styles module, which is just a really simple module that allows you to put these conditional IE style sheet declarations right in your info file. So it's just a convenient way where you know your old you need to target old IEs and you generate a separate CSS for like IE8. So you've got a responsive website. Well, for old IEs, you generally just do a fixed width static design. So if, you have, so if you're generating that IE-specific stuff, this is a really good way to target, uh, target different browsers. So now I'm going to talk about, so these are all just modules. Now I'm going to talk about some of the gems I like to work with uh, combined with an Aurora project. And these gems are put together by Team SAS. So there is actually a roller derby team called Team SAS, but I'm talking about the GitHub 
team SAS. <laughs> so the GitHub team SAS uh, has a couple members here which are interesting. Sam Richards is one of them. He created the Aurora base theme. And Ian Carousel is the maintainer, or one of the maintainers of the Aurora base theme. So by no small coincidence, these gems work really well with Aurora because they're kind of building this suite of tools that are kind of meant to be integrated together. So the first one is a toolkit gem, sorry, a, a SAS gem called Toolkit. And they refer to this as the Swiss Army Knife for Progressive Enhancement and Responsive Web Design. Basically, it's a great set of UI tools and patterns that you can use repeatedly throughout your project. So a couple examples of, of the mix-ins that come from this gem are a vertical centering mix-in. So you've got a container and you want to vertically center something inside of it. Um, it does it without tables and all this stuff. There's a really, cr a really cool like Zend index trick it's doing in there. Um, it's got another mix-in so that you, you know the flash of and style text problem when you load web fonts. So you've got a font on Typekit. I think it's in Firefox. It will show, say, Arial, and then start going and loading that web font. And suddenly Arial turns into your nice, fancy web font. So you can see that flash happen. It's got a quick mix-in to help deal with that. And uh, an intrinsic ratio mix-in is really useful. So this is an idea where you, um, you, you want to say you want to embed a YouTube video in a website. Uh, that puts in an iframe. The iframe needs to scale in proportion to the video. So it's got a quick mix-in where you say, this is the width and the height of the ratio of that container. And it automatically comes up with the CSS for you to, to make it so you can have a scalable video. Another really useful, uh, this one's a, a compass extension, it's called Breakpoint. So basically, this is a breakpoint management system where you can define all your breakpoints in pixels, because that's what we're thinking about. It might be working from comps, or certainly the, uh, the, the, the browser width inspector is going to be in, in pixels on my, on my um, uh, development environment. And so you can define all your breakpoints in pixels, and then just call them with these include breakpoint, breakpoint small, uh, we're seeing, remember, we're assuming mobile first design. So by default, our div is yellow. Then when I hit the small breakpoint, it turns red. When I hit the medium breakpoint, it turns blue. And when I hit the large breakpoint, it turns brown. So what this actually does is it will generate these media query output for you. Um, and so basically, it takes the advantage of when we first started doing responsive design, it was tricky because you put your default stuff all at the top of your file and then put one breakpoint in. And then you know start start repeating your classes inside of that breakpoint, and it was very conceptually difficult to like remember what you're doing because you're, you're you're making a number of changes either in multiple different files or in multiple different places. So this is nice if I want to work on just this one div, all the stuff that affects this one div at every particular breakpoint goes in one place. It's much easier to read. Singularity is a grid system as well. Um, it's really really powerful. You could easily have your own presentation just on singularity. But this is my preferred grid system, so I recommend to go and check it out because, of course, like every other grid system, it can spin up nice 12-column, 960-style grids. But what it's doing is, that I think is important, um, is that these grid stylings are not appearing because of class labels like grid span 4 and all that stuff in your HTML markup. This is all just in your CSS. But what singularity can do, so there's a number of really cool grid systems, but I think what's unique about singularity so it can do non-symmetric grids. So you can spin up a three-column grid where the first, middle, and last column are all different ratios to each other. And inside of that middle column, Singularity even gives you the tools to spin up yet another grid. Say I wanted to put a three-column or something inside of that central column grid. So it's really a really um, flexible and uh, powerful grid system. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about specificity and specificity wars and kind of some ideas of, of how this can come to play with a nice clean theme. So you can be theming a project and you use a dot title somewhere. And then somewhere else in your project, you use dot title again. And the second one overrides the first one. And so we uh, run into this with title, views, rows, these sort of very generic classes. You can run into a lot of problems where you change one thing here and you work for a month or two and forget about it and then you're working somewhere else in the project and you happen to use the same class somewhere else and it goes back and it affects the first one. So then you start, as your project goes on, you make more and more and more specific classes to override the previous uh, generic classes and you end up with stuff like block 23 views row, block 23 views row dot title and like, you're like, you could look at that and have no idea. If you're just looking at the CSS and you can't read the comments, you're like, 
what the hell does that have to do? So you end up battling, making more and more and more specific items. So there's a couple approaches that have evolved to deal with this specificity words problem. One is called object-oriented CSS. Uh, that's by Nicole Sullivan. She sort of pioneered this approach. Uh, another one's by Jonathan Snook named, called Smacks, and he's got a book if you you can, you know, it's a nice short read, and that's scalable and modular architecture for CSS. And what I'm going to be talking about today is more focusing on BEM. Uh, it stands for Block Element Modifier. So these are similar approaches, like different, the similar philosophies for dealing with a specificity problem, um, where you basically take your objects and you take, um, you, you, you think about your design components as discrete pieces, and these are three approaches that help you, uh, help you name naming conventions and visualize how to deal with these approaches. So the first idea is you think about, you stop thinking about design as in like block 23 output from views, and you start, stop worrying about like Drupalisms that just because it, this, the markup happens to generate these classes on it, you don't actually necessarily want to use that. You need to start thinking about user interface components and have, um, and have your approach come out from these user interface components um, as its core component for um, how you're styling your sites. So I'm just going to jump into it and, and take a look at how this is, so as I said, there's a couple different varieties of themes that come out of Aurora. This is the Corona sort of default folder structure. And you end up with a SAS folder. And inside of your SAS folder, you've got a styles.scss, which I've circled at the bottom. You know, I highlighted at the beginning where SAS can load a bunch of small files into one file and output one CSS. This is exactly what's going to happen. So you load some config variables. Then there's some global styles that affect your site site-wide. Then you load layouts, components, and vendor components. So we'll go over these all in detail. But what we're looking at here in that SCSS file is literally like a manifest of all the little pieces of your website get documented in this one .scss file. And so, um, so it's very structured in, in how it's approached. So let's talk about the config folder. That's the first thing you're going to load. You load a bunch of variables in. So you might load color variables, your grids, like when your grids change, maybe they change at different responsive sizes, those breakpoints I showed before. And mixins, right? Mixins are those general functions that until you call the mixin, um, it's just a library that you can use later. So what's interesting about what happens in the config folder is if you just compiled just the config folder, not a single line of CSS would be generated because you're just sort of setting up your project and a bunch of variables and defaults. Next thing that happens is you, you define your styles in the global folder. And so a lot of projects start with normalize.css. So this is a uh, a tool set that makes all the different browsers sort of behave, uh, behave the same regardless of which browser you're using. So we load normalize, then we declare our default typography, uh, and then we might want to include our site-wide extendables. So remember, extendables are like specific chunks that you could reuse in different places. So a good example of a site-wide extendable you might want to use is a clear fix, right? Like lots of different places you want to use clear fixes. And then finally, default styles for forms. And this is where you might want to use a library called Formalize, which is kind of like the same as Normalize, except it makes forms behave the same in different browsers, which is basically styling forms is something that is always a big pain in the ass. So another way to think about what belongs in the global folder is actually what's in the main content area of your website. So if this is like, you know, if this is a blog, the stuff that's in the article is the most generic styles that should appear. So we're talking default paragraphs, default headings, maybe inline images, that kind of stuff. What does not belong in the global folder is the social share icons, the author bio, those kinds of things. While these components might appear on every page of the website or whatever, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about global. It's really more, um, really more those default attributes that, that would appear in your main content area. Or another way of thinking about it is whatever your content editors are putting into a WYSIWYG, that's a good candidate for stuff that should appear in your, your, your global folder. So now I'm going to talk about layouts. Layouts have a convention where you put L under, you know, the partials get named by L dash and then the name of, of the partial. These, basically what you can do is put one file that controls everything that happens to just the header of your website in one place. So your response to breakpoints, your header might change like three or four different breakpoints might need to be uh, appropriate to make it flex between all different sizes. But your masthead or something might just change. In this case, you know, the images change and, and the padding changes in, these, in this layout. Uh, the header is going to go through a lot more steps. 
And then, say, for example, the articles here, you can see a main body with a column on the right. At some point, that, that, that column, when the browser's too small, has got to stick underneath. So this is where the layout files for these elements belong. And basically, you can think about, you know, we're breaking it into little chunks where you can worry about just one little piece of the layout. And so if, if you're theming it and the, the, the menu looks weird at a particular size, you know which layout it's coming in from. So it's very easy to identify where to go and fix it. Another really cool thing with layouts is when you start combining them with panels. So inside of panels, it's got this uh, really easy way to theme a panel's region. OK? <laughs> um, and so the, the panel's region styles is really simple. It's got a default, and you can change them. And it's really easy to write plugins that expand what they do. So you can actually make your own custom layouts. Make, uh, so you make the, the, the region template for panels. And then you make a vendor, uh, sorry, a matching layout partial. And you can then simply select. So these panels, these are components in an aside region. And you can simply, just by clicking through some of these pre-built layouts, you could make it so that it starts as one column and goes to two. And then you might make a different one where it starts as one column and breaks to three, three rows. So it's a really useful tool in there. And so what a layout file might actually look like is something like this. Um, I've de declared the partial, up, uh, sorry, the placeholder with uh, up top and then the class name below. So I just call it L region. I say this is, it's actually much easier to see when it's dark. Uh, lights off? Okay. Anyway, at least with these dark screens, it's much easier. So, so you can see that in this layout, by default, it's just going to behave, the, so these panels that are appearing in this region are just going to go full column because that's by default they're, they're divs and that's what they do. And then when I hit the medium breakpoint, the panels become 50% and the first one floats left and the second one floats right. So this is like a really digestible, simple chunk that you can sort of comprehend and see on its own, sitting in its own file. So I'm going to skip over the load order. Components would be the, the next thing that you want to load, but this is actually, I'm just going to hop over to vendors because it's much more simple. And this is where you've got themes and say, remember I talked about in Magic, you just go ahead and turn off all the CSS for many of the different contrib modules you're working with. Um, here is where you might, say you're going to just, it makes more sense to, you, you spend more time overriding the styles that are already there than create, you know, than you could author on your own. I just copy that CSS file out of the module, paste it in the vendors folder, put a .scss on it so that I can Use, so, use my SAS functions and tools and hack away at it. So what, what, what vendor folder means is you're kind of overrided something that came to you from contrib or, or like an installed library or something automatically. So one example is like flex slider, like we override all the time because it's default styling is a little crazy. But then something like date picker, which is uses the jQuery UI to you know, pop up a cool little calendar, usually that's pretty good out of the box and maybe you just need to override a few like colors or something. So if you're doing that, I just put a date picker.scss file and then just those minor overrides right in here. And so by seeing that it's in the vendors folder, um, it's not, you know, these modules are not designed with BEM syntax in mind and all these things. So this is sort of the, the dumping ground for overrides and changes from stuff that comes from contrib and other libraries. And who knows what ends up you put, you're putting in there. So let's talk about components, and this is really uh, the, core of, uh, the core of this idea behind structuring your websites like this. Each user interface element gets its own partial folder that goes inside of this, uh, sorry, its own partial file that goes inside of the components folders. So what is a UI component? So we look at Drupal.org, the site search, you know, you could have components underscore site dash search dot uh, The map thing that shows like the most recent updates would be its own component. Or tabs, right? Just like different elements that maybe they appear in only one place in your website, like that map, or maybe they're 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 appearing all over the place, like these tabs. They're each their own user interface components, and you end up with this folder. By the time you get to the end of a project, where you have a bazillion little components sitting inside of this folder, each sort of clearly organized by their main their main titles. And so we use this. We name these files in a pattern, so that when we name our are the contents inside of these files, it follows exactly the same pattern. So it's very easy to identify which CSS classes belong in which component folder. So this is where BEM comes in. So BEM stands for 
block element modifier. Now this is just a naming convention. And really what we're trying to do here is fight that, that specificity war. So what we end up doing is actually making one unique class for every single element that we're theming in our website. We apply one and only one class to each, each component. And as your site grows, you end up with these long, kind of verbose, crazy class names. But there's a lot of meaning expressed in how these class names are written. So by default, we've got site search. That's the block. And in this presentation, I'll use block and component interchangeably because in Drupal, it's really confusing to talk about blocks. It's just this naming convention is, that's where it started. So, um, so site search, let's say, is the component. And then site search double underscore field would be the class that you apply to the text input, let's say, inside of a search box. And by the fact that it's got a double underscore underneath it is expressing that it is a child of the parent component. Then we've got another concept called modifiers where we've got site search double hyphen full. So this is expressing that full is a variation of site search. So maybe we've got the site search, site search box in the top right of our website on every single page and then you go, you know, you go to an advanced search mode or something and there is more complexity in that, in, in that user interface element. It's still got all the same core styles or whatever, but it's got this variation where we want to layer on additional complexity. So, and I recommend checking out that link as well. It really, really defines uh, BEM and what it's all about very clearly. So let's take a look at a specific example. This is just, uh, just a website layout that's got a big tall page. And at the bottom of every single big tall page in this website, they've got this big purple callout block, right? And so this is a user interface convention that we called uh, call to action dot scss. And so this, this partial would be sitting inside of my components folder. And let's identify what the pieces are that would build up this, this component. So the outer wrapper, the outer div that contains all this will be class call to action. The title itself will receive the class call to action double underscore title. And then the button that's, you know, we want you to do something uh, is going to get call to action double underscore button. And so the notice I didn't bother to define anything in the middle, that's because the global type styles for this website would already define what a default paragraph is. And in this case, it doesn't happen to be any different than the default. What it's important to see is it's really easy to see, even, you know, imagine you inspect anywhere in the website, it's really easy to see call to action button. If you just saw that on its own, it's very clear what component and what partial you need to look at to go and edit this. So let's take a look at some of the CSS. You know, call to action, we, def we define uh, so SCSS. We define the background color, give it a color, and some padding. Really simple. Then we define call to action title. We probably need to redefine the color because you know, the default colors of the website for titles are probably not going to be white because you saw the background was like white text. So we need to redefine uh, or override the global styles in this case to make the title uh, the correct color. And then finally, we're going to look at the call to action double underscore button. This element you see is actually including an extend where I'm extending a placeholder called button double hyphen arrow. So what this is telling me is there's a partial in my components folder already that I've created called button. And one of the button styles that's available to this website is the variation called arrow. And so that's just adding that little, little fo the follow arrow inside of the text. And then just after that, I declare that the background color should be dark purple. So let's take a look at variations, right? Say, so in this website, in they kind of got a color palette per section, right? And so this same call to action element has an orange variation. So it's the, by default, it's purple. Somewhere else, it's orange. So we have our same class structure that we've defined already to define the purple one. So we simply extend the core component, and then apply the overrides that are unique to, um, to that element. So what's good about this is, you know, at the end of the day, each of these elements has only one class applied. So there's absolutely no chance that if I make a change to call to action orange, it's going to go and affect something else in my website. And what's also good about it, because we're using the awesomeness of SAS, if I say change the padding in that, in that call to action default block to 4Ms or whatever, that's going to automatically inherit through in the CSS output to the orange block as well. So let's take a look at the button, right? Remember in the previous example, we extended a partial from somewhere else, this, this button double hyphen arrow. We're still going to just follow the same pattern, right? We're still going to extend 
the default element inside of this particular component and then override it for the elements that are different. And the reason, you know, you could actually extend button arrow in the second element as well, but like say you wanted to go and add something to this, you know, you add, um, uh, increase the padding, right? Another good example. You want to make sure that those inheritances cascade throughout, C throughout the um, rendered CSS and maintain the relationship between the variations of a component and its sort of parent root component. So this is what the actual CSS file is going to end up looking like. I use a convention where um, you use a placeholder to declare uh, a placeholder first and then the actual class name after. And I'll just get into this in a second. But you, know, you can imagine this partial has the call to action and the call to action variation beneath it. It's really easy to see the relationship between these. As we go down the file, this is now starting to in indicate why I use placeholders first and then the class name second. We can see the placeholder. This element probably should be called cl call to action double underscore title. But because sometimes Drupal, you know, if you want to put one class on every single field and element that comes out of Drupal, that can be really time consuming and sometimes not practical. So we built this one in panels. And if you're familiar with panels at all, it wraps the title of a panel in a div called pain title and makes it an H2 by default, right? So we put the idealized, what this should be in BEM syntax as the first line, and then we put in our, we kind of fix our crufty Drupal output uh, as, as the second item there as well. And so we do this is because when we extend items, we extend the placeholders of what they ought to be to maintain the legibility and readability of this file. And of course, we, we keep this, keep this continue to follow the pattern. And again, links might be another place where, you know, Drupal doesn't, you know, it's sometimes kind of challenging to get a class name on the actual link without any wrappers on it. So this is sort of your workaround uh, if you're not able to control the classes directly. So since I did this presentation, or since we did this website, I came across a module that really goes far to help reducing the need to use those weird sort of overrides. And this is called semantic panels. And what it does, uh, and of course, this is assuming you're using panels module. What it does is it lets you control the wrapper for the panel, the wrapper for the title, the wrapper for the content. You can choose what that HTML element is, and you can choose exactly what the class is on that. So by using this tool and the other ones I was mentioning before, there are, it should be pretty few and far between where you have to use something other than the proper BIM, BIM syntax on your classes. So what do we get out of all this, right? Like this is, you know, what's, what's the benefit of doing all this? We end up with lots of little bite-sized chunks of code that means that when we've got many small files and we're working collaboratively on large projects and version control, that means there's fewer collisions that are going to happen between our files. And I think most importantly, each partial, you know, really shouldn't be more than 100 to 200 lines tall. So my 80, capac 80 gigabyte capacity brain can, like, digest and understand one partial in its entirety as an isolated component, and I can just think about one, one element without worrying about um, how it's going to cascade out through the rest of the website. Another benefit is when you're inspecting and sort of debugging or uh, working on a project, you know, getting onboarded with it, you can really easily see what partial, just by the names of classes, where you should be going to edit. Say you want to edit this stock ticker thing out there. I know I'm looking in a stock ticker partial. So it's, easy, it's easier to figure out what to edit. And as a side effect of this, it's, really e it's much easier to onboard other people into your projects because it's got a structure, right? It's not like my style of how I felt to name things. It's got this organized pattern that expresses the relationship between child elements and parent elements. Finally, uh, another benefit is that because we've got this nice clean structure here, we can recycle components of one project, like uh, spe specifically layouts, right? Because they don't actually style how an object looks. They style how it flows out in the website. So there's many places where you're going to want something to go from one column, you know, a one column grid of objects to a two column grid of objects to a 12 column grid of objects or whatever. So it's very easy to recycle those layouts because the partials are clearly organized like this. And so, and this is also comes into that stuff where I was talking about if you make a particular panel theme that has a matching partial, that style, you can just copy over to your second project, and now you've got a little select box. You hit, OK, take all the stuff inside of this panel region and put it in a two-column grid. So you can kind of build up this library of reusable patterns. And you can actually reuse the user interface patterns themselves quite a bit. 
and because they're in their own small partials. So say you make like, you do all the painful work necessary to do a good responsive table layout or something. Well, the colors and the fonts and all that stuff's gonna be different project to project. You can easily see and identify and copy that to, from project A to project B. And because you're using variables to declare everything like padding and colors and all that, it's really easy to recycle your work between different projects. It also has a benefit of being really good with style prototyping. So style prototyping, if you're familiar with style tiles, style prototyping is the idea that very early on in the project, you get you know, your default colors, your default type and all that stuff into a probably an HTML mockup. And you sit this down in front of your team, your clients, and you're showing them actual type in a web browser early on in the project. You could even be using your SAS partial folder structures at this phase. Like you don't even have a Drupal website yet. You're just working on creative and helping to move your creative process along. So, so you end up making useful code. That partial actually makes it into your final production release code because you're defining these styles. So it's really kind of, um, it's efficient to keep this modularity because then you can, you can really enhance your design process. So in conclusion, whoa. <laughs> I know this is a lot of stuff. So thank you very much. Uh, I've got the slides linked here. And if, uh, please, if you're excited and interested about SAS, please do join the SAS Toronto meetup. Thank you.